KGB. A little something from the nice guys. Come on. All right, really honored to be here with these two panelists. Um, Again, Sam Callahan is lead analyst here at Swan, and Natalie Smolensky, she is a startup and nonprofit founder and an economic anthropologist. And both of them have been doing so much work in the arena of talking about digital privacy, CBDCs, surveillance. So let's kind of set the scene for everyone to start off because the battle for digital privacy has really been going on for a long time. So can you both talk a little bit about the history of sort of encryption versus surveillance and where we really are today in terms of how private are our digital lives? Uh, yeah, I can jump off. Um, so Bitcoin is just the latest iteration of encryption versus surveillance. And it really, it goes all the way back to any kind of new technological innovation in communications. And so you think about the printing press, think about the telegraph, think about um, the internet. Each one empowered individuals to allow people to communicate more freely, but at the same time, it also empowered the state to be able to surveil. And really, when it comes down to it, just think about, say, the telegraph. Um, there was like labor constraints and resource constraints for the state to be able to surveil the mass population. I mean, you had to have a, tens of thousands of people reading the telegrams, um, and, and there was a lot of capital that needed to be allocated to be able to surveil. It was very difficult to do. But with the advent of the internet, those constraints are no longer there. And this is what the cypherpunks really uh, kind of saw or foresaw with the uh, internet adoption rising. They were like, okay, this is gonna make it very easy for the state to surveil us. And so we need a new constraint on them. We need encryption. And they really saw encryption as this impenetrable shield that can protect the individual in the digital age. And that kind of led us all the way up to where we are now with Bitcoin. Yeah, um, absolutely. So there is constantly a race between state and society um, for technological dominance and preeminence. Um, this, this race uh, creates something that political scientists have called the Red Queen effect, um, based on the Alice in Wonderland story, where Alice races with the Red Queen. Um, and this race between state and society creates a narrow corridor of liberty. The problem happens when the balance shifts too much um, in the direction of one of these actors. Um, you, you stop having the equilibrium effect of, um, on the one hand, the rule of law, which is extremely important for protecting rights, including privacy. And um, on the other hand, you can have tyranny um, in which the state becomes so overbearing that there is no room for liberty. Um, the challenge is that now the pace of technological advance is so fast that um, in many areas, the state seems to be outstripping civil society in its capabilities. And so the preservation of these islands of privacy through encryption um, is one of the main ways that we can ensure privacy endures into the 21st century. Many of us started using you know, the early internet not thinking about any of this, right? All of our data is already out there. Can you talk a little bit about the sense of maybe apathy that exists? Because a lot of people probably feel like, my stuff's already there, how can I protect it at this point? And can Bitcoin sort of almost represent a turning point where you can start to gain more privacy and agency over your information? Well, I think it's, it's a great question because a lot of Americans actually, it's, it's basically do they um, prioritize security or they prioritize their own privacy? And you'll actually find that about 50% are completely fine with the government collecting as much, as much data as they need in order to feel secure, which is surprising to me, 50% of Americans. Um, but I think it's important to understand what privacy means. And it goes back to this idea of like, I have nothing to hide. But at the same time, you know, privacy is so important to our democracy because if everyone feels like they're gonna be surveilled and looking over their shoulder, what happens is there's a self-censorship that occurs and they feel like they can't uh, you know, spread ideas that aren't politically favorable. And so it's really, it impacts kind of a pillar of our society. Um, and so people have to understand what they're giving up 
when you talk about, oh, I want more security, I want the state to surveil us, um, they're giving up something much more than just say like them uh, reading their Instagram or their messages or things like that. They're giving up really a, a critical part of their, their democracy. Yeah, um, so when we think about privacy, one of the questions that often emerges is, what is it and how is it different from, you know, example, secrecy? Um, I would suggest that privacy is a mode of relating. Privacy doesn't say anything about what you do or do not know about another person. It's how you acquire that information, under what circumstances. Is it a respectful exchange where you're preserving the autonomy of the counterparty in your information transaction, to put it that way. You're preserving their autonomy to self-disclose at will. So Eric Hughes, one of the early cypherpunks, uh, defined privacy as um, the right to choose how you self-disclose um, and what you reveal to the world. The problem that, that we're facing now is that there, the default has shifted from people not knowing things about you to them knowing things about you. Um, this also uh, compromises what uh, sociologist Irving Goff has called civil inattention. You know, when you're in a public situation, you're not staring at everyone. That's super weird. It makes people feel threatened. Um, people practice a kind of aversion of the gaze, a kind of not knowing certain things, even if they're getting information that they didn't ask for. Well, with, you know, mass surveillance technologies, now sort of everyone can stare all the time. Um, and so the basic modalities of showing respect to other people and care in social uh, interactions are breaking down. And predictably, this also has a corrosive effect on society. I think there's a lack of understanding of the difference, especially gov with governments, right? Because privacy is about protecting what you have, whereas secrecy is about hiding something because you don't want people to know because potentially it's nefarious. Um, CBDC seem like a natural progression of the increased, you know, consolidation of power of the state, increased surveillance, and trying to maintain that grip on power. So can you talk about sort of that that battle between the forces of control, which will be the CBDC, versus the forces of freedom, Bitcoin, and individual individualism and sovereignty? Yeah, and I, I mean, I'd love to hear Natalie's take on this as well. But um, to me, a CBDC it represents the next level up in terms of the surveillance capabilities um, because it's with the money itself. And there's so much information you can get from tracking financial information at, at kind of granular level and be able to control it. Um, and, and so when you think about a CBDC, it really would allow them to have basically any kind of information. And then from that information, you can really tell a lot about the person, who they are, where they interact with, where they spend their money, um, and which can lead to censorship from a, a you know, tyrannical government if they had that power. And so a lot of people argue that you know, this isn't going to be a benevolent government or a benev benevolent actor with this kind of power or this tool. And so we should just refrain from them having it at all. But I think where you look at the system, where things are headed, it has to kind of go this way for them because the system's getting too out of control. It's getting too unstable. The debt's getting too large. And so when that happens, they have to kind of tie things down. There's more capital controls. They have to be able to basically uh, attack savers and trap them. Like uh, Jim Rickards says, when pigs are slaughtered, they're herded into pens. And, and when savers want to get slaughtered, they're going to herd them into digital accounts with negative interest rates in which there's no escape. And so Bitcoin, to me, represents that escape. And that's exactly what Christine Lagarde said. You know, she's kind of said the quiet part out loud. You know, Bitcoin is an escape. And if there is an escape, people will use it. And when this system looks like it's kind of falling apart, they're going to have to entrap people in it. They're going to try to, like, close that escape as much as they can. And then it's up to us to build the tools necessary to people to continue to be access to it. Right, yeah. Um, CBDCs, from my point of view, represent um, an inevitable outgrowth of the confluence of two types of money, um, credit money and state money. Um, so in, in the early 20th century, um, a number of theories of money were published. 
uh, mostly by German academics. Um, and, you know, one of them by George Friedrich Knopp called the state theory of, theory of money, in effect argued that now that we have this powerful state, we no longer need commodity monies. Um, now, in effect, all money is credit, all money is chartalist, all money is fiat, and that is a good thing. Um, John Maynard Keynes uh, then was instrumental in ensuring the translation of Knopf's work into English in 1924 um, and cites it himself in, in his treatise on money um, as simply the fact. Um, in all civilized nations, he writes, um, chartalist money, uh, money is chartalist. Um, it has taken several generations to understand the implications of this. Um, money is, is an information technology. It communicates information, as um, Nick Sabo has really wonderfully shown in his work on the origins of money. Um, and so if the state is the origin and source of a, a type of money, um, it is no big leap to imagine that it will use that money for full surveillance. Um, and so what we're seeing with the rise of Bitcoin is an alternative monetary technology um, that also has the capacity as a second order effect to act as a privacy technology. I really want to dig into more of the idea of credit versus commodity money, because I know you're doing a lot of research into this. And if you guys have read Broken Money by Lynn Alden, she goes over the differences. Um, it was also in Principles of Economics. And what I thought Lynn did so thoughtfully is she boiled it down to the question of who controls the ledger. So with commodity money, it's essentially nature. And with credit money, it's a central authority being increasingly this powerful state. Can you talk a little bit about how the properties of, of the monetary system in, with, with credit money leads to this consolidation of power? And ultimately, even though you know, the numbers are with the people, right? But the state, with, with fewer actors, the elites, seem so powerful that we can't overtake the control that they've achieved. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, from the point of view of state theorists of money, Money is a creature of law. That is their thesis. And so the state, as the arbiter of law, determines what money is. By declaring something legal tender, the state has, in effect, monopolized what money is within their jurisdiction. And there's, there's no question. I mean, even, even today, the, the Bank for International Settlements, uh, which sets banking policy uh, worldwide for participating institutions, defines final settlement as a legal definition. Um, the problem is that these theories don't have any account for the origin of law itself. Where does the law come from? How is the law legitimized? What happens under conditions of breakdown of law? Well, those are precisely the use cases that a commodity money is designed to be very useful in. Yeah, no, I, I disagree with everything you said. And that's kind of what Lynn says in her book as well. You know, when things aren't kosher between countries, that's when, you know, credit money falls apart. And, and that's when commodity com com uh, money really rises. You see that in times of war, where commodity money gets popular again. And so I would just agree with everything Natalie just said. I don't know if I have much to add beyond that. Well, let's talk a little bit more about CBDCs because we've seen increased financial censorship. And even though we're the global reserve currency, we're not the first to put out you know, a CBDC. There have been unsuccessful experiments in places like Nigeria and the Bahamas. We know that in China, they've been experimenting with one that seems very dystopian with a social credit score. So can you talk about you know, where do you see this going? Some, some analysts say that the Fed doesn't want a CBDC and they're going to do anything to prevent that from happening, but yet they've put out press releases about Fed now. So how do you see this eventually taking hold? Will we all have a CBDC account and what will that look like? Well, there's kind of a difference here between wholesale CBDCs and retail CBDCs, whereas a lot of people think of CBDCs, they think of a retail CBDC where you have an account directly at the Federal Reserve and they're going to be able to track everything and it's going to kind of compete with commercial banks. And I, I'm pretty optimistic that that's going to be delayed for a long time in terms of that design in the United States of America. 
Um, now there's some talk of that happening in like Europe where it's a lot more concerning. Um, the, Fed, the Federal Reserve has explored a wholesale CBDC and they are doing different pilot programs like Project Hamilton, Project Ubin, Project Cedar, where they're kind of exploring how it could uh, improve the efficiencies of payments between entities, large wholesale payments kind of competing with Fedwire. Um, but to me, it's, it's, it's like they don't want to have a direct account with the Fed if they do go the retail account because they don't have the operational capacities or the compliance capacities to really take on all that business. They're not, the Federal Reserve is not a customer facing organization. They want to keep the commercial banks doing all of that. They don't want to take on the risks. They don't want to take on the costs. And they also don't want to disintermediate the commercial banks because of financial instability issues. And so they want to create a two tiered model. And this is what uh, the digital euro is trying to do as well where they basically have CBDC accounts at the commercial banks, and then the commercial banks will handle all like, you know, the wallet infrastructure, all the tracking, all the reporting, um, all the customer-facing tasks that they're already uh, you know, set up to do. They'll just do that with a CBDC account. And, so they'll, and then the last thing I'll add is that they want to cap it. They want to make sure that this is a product that doesn't suck bank deposits out of these commercial banks into a CBDC account and risk removing their cheapest and uh, largest source of funding, which is bank accounts, or deposits, excuse me. And so they want to cap these CBDC accounts at like $3,000, or they want to uh, have penalties, like negative interest rates associated with these accounts, which is really funny because they say it's going to improve payments, but how is that uh, beneficial to improving payments if there's built-in restrictions in it? It's just going to add friction to its usage as a payment mechanism. And so it kind of thwarts other purported benefits because they don't want to disintermediate the bank. So they want it to be a good product, product, but they don't want it to be too good. And so that's a sign that it's not going to be a good product at all. <laughs> they should probably never do it. Um, and so you know that's kind of how they're designing this thing. Um, and we can push back at it, but it's like what uh, Natalie says. It, this is kind of inevitable in a lot of ways because of just how the system's structured. Yeah, the, the state does not voluntarily roll back its own power. Um, ever, uh, it, it, you know, it, it consolidates until there are major disruption events, um, and then alternatives emerge. Okay, so I think that we are sort of at an inflection point, right? And the people that are here, for the most part, I would assume they're Bitcoiners. So maybe they're listening to something like this, saying, "Well, I'm okay. I've got Bitcoin. I'm, I'm not going to buy into this whole CBDC." What do you, what's the message for how this will impact everyone? There are going to be implications, including for Bitcoiners. What are the risks and what do people need to know that they can take away from this conversation? Um, I think, that, you know, Bitcoin is, is obviously already in and of itself an extraordinary intervention here, but um, the manner in which the vast majority of people access Bitcoin continues to be intermediated. Um, and all forms of intermediation will be subject to capture on a long enough timeline. Um, and so uh, I see the technology race to build convenient, easily accessible self-custody solutions as perhaps the most important initiative right now in, in the Bitcoin world. I mean, I would just echo exactly what Natalie just said. It's up to us to, as an industry to be more agile and innovative if we're going to be moving against this large state actor who's going to come down with the surveillance tools. That's actually one of the things this, the cypherpunk said uh, early on. They're like, hey, I think we can actually win this because we're smaller, we're more agile, we're innovative, we're technologists. We can build tools and technologies that thwart their, their plans of surveillance. Um, no longer have to go by laws, but we can actually just build concrete technologies that prevent them from, from achieving their goals. And when you look at Bitcoin today, I mean, there, it's, it's pseudonymous, right? Um, but, but I think there are improvements on pr with privacy on its way in different layers of scaling. Um, CoinJoin is one of them, but also Lightning has better uh, privacy guarantees than the base chain, but also things like Fediment um, has better privacy and, and using things like uh, Chami and Mints to kind of help with privacy as well. Uh, I think that'll just continue to develop over time, but there is a race here. There is a race here. So like maybe we can't stop a CBDC from coming, 
but maybe we can delay it to give us more time to build the tools necessary to allow people to self-custody more easily. And I've been very uh, uh, encouraged by the development over the last couple of years in terms of custody solutions. Um, they're getting better, they're getting easier, the UX is getting better. There's just more of them, there's more wallets. Um, and so I just want more of that. I want more development, I want more solutions, more tools, uh, specifically geared towards better UX and UI. Well, going back to the idea of, of apathy, that so many people have their information already out there, maybe it's already been scrubbed, there, there's also been a cultural shift where people put more information out there. You know, I mean, decades ago, you wouldn't imagine that folks would be, you know, turning their uh, camera on, talking about maybe intimate details of their lives, but things have culturally shifted. And I know, you, Natalie, you study, you know, shifting um, morals and values within society. So. Do you have hope that within society we can increase maybe people's desire to have and, and, and fight to protect their privacy? Or do you worry that we're sort of going in, in a direction where it's going to be, you know, maybe the Bitcoiners fighting for this and the majority of people saying, I give up and for the security and convenience, I don't care who has my information? I think the, the rising awareness in younger generations that they're always being surveilled whether it's you know, through their social media accounts or simply ambiently as they go about their lives. You know, cameras everywhere, um, people can film them almost at any time. You, you never know, you know when something about you is going to become public information. What this has done is it's, it's, it, it's nurtured a subjectivity in young people where um, they develop performance skills very early on. So they understand that being in public is being on stage. And you can actually see this. I recently watched some home videos from the 90s. And the cultural differences are striking. People don't act like they're on camera. They, they often aren't even aware of the camera being there. Um, now, you know, everything is kind of curated. People have a stage presence, a stage voice. They know um, when they're being watched. That has also created a sharper split between, I would suggest, the performance of everyday life that is on display and a kind of private sphere that doesn't ever get touched by that. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that evolves culturally. Definitely, Sam. Well, I just think the pendulum has shifted so far the other way. And like, like Natalie said, the younger generations, I saw a very fascinating trend of younger generations actually preferring flip phones now which was really cool to see cuz like you know my age we were kind of we grew up in this rise of technology and the smartphone um, I can't imagine what it's been like for these younger generations to be born into that world and and now you see them kind of um, kind of attracted to these older technologies that don't have as much surveillance, you know? They, they don't want to be as connected, uh, some of them. There's this counter trend happening uh, that, again, is super encouraging because they have to fight back against this little bit or else these, their freedoms will continue to get eroded if, if they don't start to kind of combine their, their willingness to just say no. Like, I, I'm going to reject these technologies and the convenience associated with them because I care about my private, my, my privacy. Well, it's, it's almost time to wrap up. I want to get your final thoughts, but um, my final question really is if, if y the folks here and the folks watching this at home online, if they could just do one thing today, this week, this month to make their lives more private, what would it be? Their digital lives, digital identities. I can go first on that. I think, I, I think just... Um, Understanding that you know this device right here, <laughs> if the government could plan and design a surveillance machine, it would be a smartphone that we carry around in our pockets every single day of our lives. Um, it listens to us, if you, and everyone kind of knows. There's like a nihilism attached to it, where you get an ad on Instagram. Like I, I remember, I mentioned some random pizza place one time. I've never heard of it in my life. It's like this random Italian joint. And it popped up in an ad in my phone. And I'm like, yep, they're listening. So if you are having a conversation that you don't want and, uh, you know, out there and somebody listening to you that's more private, don't have your smartphones in that room, like, at all. You know, put it on airplane mode all the time when you're sleeping. Get it out of there uh, whenever you want to be private. That's probably the number one thing you can do. And then I would say, uh, you know, buy Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to wrap it up here. But, 
you know, uh, I'm sure most of us got the, the FEMA alert the other day. Um, there wasn't a way to opt out of that. Um, and increasingly, there will not be ways to opt out. Not having a smart device will become criminalized. Not being online all the time will, will become criminalized. Um, and so I would suggest nurture habits and practices of privacy. Prioritize based on what's most important to you. And then use that to be a political subject. That's wonderful. And we can peacefully opt into Bitcoin. So Natalie, Sam, thank you so much. Everyone, round of applause. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you. Oh, hi. Do you have your ticket to the next Pacific Bitcoin Festival? Join us as we shine a light on the best of Bitcoin and Bitcoiners. Visit PacificBitcoin.com for the best deal on tickets now.